We've covered an awful lot of ground in this short series. And as we come down to Lecture 8, I want to give a, a brief summary and then look at a few contemporary examples of how some of the uh, lines that I've been tracing out manifest themselves in ways in society that really uh, have an impact upon us all and about which we should all be concerned and have opinions. But to go back to my very first lecture, if you remember, I said there were four things that I was particularly interested in in the modern world that characterized the modern world in contrast to cultures that had gone before. I said the modern person is characterized by what I denoted as expressive individualism. That is the idea that today to be fully you means to give public and social expression to that which you feel inside rather than looking around to society if you like and finding out what we need to learn in order to conform we tend to think of the real us as that which is within us. We use words like authentic. He's an authentic person. What you see is what you get. What you get outwardly is what he is inwardly. We prize spontaneity. People who do things, you know, apparently because it just wells up from within them. Expressive individualism. And we see the roots of that, said in Rousseau. Even in an odd way, we, we see it in Freud, certainly in Nietzsche and in Oscar Wilde. I also said that the modern person sees happiness as an inward sense of psychological satisfaction. If I had a longer time, I'd trace out the intimate connection that exists between this and expressive individualism. Suffice it to say that this is really the underlying theme from Rousseau onwards, that happiness, happiness is ultimately an internal state, an internal psychological feeling. Even Marx's concept of alienation touches on that kind of notion of happiness as well. I also said the modern world is a world that sees all things imminently. What I meant by that is the modern world is one where really the, the appeal to something transcendent, the appeal to an order, a sacred order beyond this social order in which we exist, a sacred world beyond this secular world where we find ourselves, the appeal to such an order for authority is now profoundly implausible. And we saw that in many of our thinkers. The Romantics, in some ways, were trying to maintain some sort of transcendence through their adoration of the power of nature. But certainly when we come to Marx and Nietzsche, Freud and Reich, we have profoundly eminent thinkers. They do not look beyond to anything sacred in order to make sense of this world or to frame their politics. This world is all that there is. They are, in a sense, radical materialists on that front. And again, that's often how many of us think about the world, isn't it? Even many Christians sort of, yes, believe in God, but don't particularly allow that belief to shape how they think about the everyday world and their everyday interactions with people. And finally, I said that a fourth aspect of the modern world was the sexual revolution. We talked about that last with uh, Wilhelm Reich and how sexual codes... Sexual morality has come to be not simply modified in our contemporary world, but we might say completely overthrown because sexual codes have come to be seen as oppressive, as preventing and hindering both that expressive individualism that's so important, my ability to behave outwardly as I feel inwardly, and also as inhibiting that happiness as psychological satisfaction. If the purpose of society is to make as many people happy as possible, then the unleashing of sexual instincts, the abolition of sexual codes, becomes important. And we saw in the work of Wilhelm Reich how he formulated a specific politics around this notion of the overthrowing, the dismantling of sexual codes. So that's a sort of overview of the course as a whole. What I want to do now in the remaining minutes is this. I want to look at just three things in modern society where we can see the the fingerprints of these traits, these trends that I've been tracing, things that perhaps caught some of us unawares and did so because we didn't realise that what we witness today in dramatic court decisions, for example, is simply the latest stage in a process that's been going on for a long, long time, the process that I've been describing in these lectures. I want to look at law, I want to look briefly at ethics, I want to look at freedom of speech. I have about 15 minutes remaining, so inevitably my treatment of each of these is going to be very superficial.
But I hope it gives you a little taste of the significance of the ideas that we've been tracing out in previous lectures. Legally, where does this expressive individualism and this psychological happiness, where does that uh, come to play in, in the law of the land at this point? Well, here I just want to refer briefly to a very famous statement by Justice Anthony Kennedy, who wrote the opinion in the 1992 Supreme Court case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Bob Casey Sr., Governor of Pennsylvania, Governor of Pennsylvania had uh, written into law a rule that placed some restrictions on abortion clinics, and Planned Parenthood uh, brought a, a case against him that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the judgment in favor of Planned Parenthood and against Casey in this matter, Anthony Kenney penned these lines. At the heart of liberty, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood were they formed under compulsion of the state. It's an interesting sentence. Interesting couple of sentences. It's oddly incoherent, of course. The state has to define personhood at some level, that's why it considers murder to be wrong. There is an assumption of what it is to be a person that lies behind statutes against murder that are enforced and imposed by the states. But what's more interesting is not the philosophical incoherence, if you like, of what's being said here. What's really interesting is the definition of personhood he's working with. Let me repeat the sentence. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Think about that. That's the notion of liberty, of expressive individualism. That line could have been written by Nietzsche, could have been written by, Ma, uh, by uh, uh, Oscar Wilde, could have been written in some ways by Rousseau. Anthony Kennedy isn't inventing that in 1992. Anthony Kennedy is intuiting that in 1992 because the world in which he lives is the world that has been profoundly shaped by the thinking and the ideas of the men and women we've been looking at in this course. It represents, it arises out of a culture where liberty, where freedom, is understood as self-determination. Where meaning is defined by the individual. And where really underlying it are notions of authenticity and psychological happiness that are being allowed to trump everything at this particular point. What that ruling, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, does, we might say, perhaps provocatively, is it establishes in law the kind of expressive individualism we noted in Lecture 1 and traced in subsequent lectures. And that ruling has been foundational to subsequent Supreme Court judgments, particularly relative to the sexual revolution. Think of gay marriage judgment, uh, Obergefell versus Hodges, 2015. It's essentially predicated on the rights of the individual to be happy in the way they choose and the obligation of the state to affirm them in that. Again, that ruling rests on expressive individualism. Make no mistake, at this point I'm not uh, expressing either approval or disapproval of that ruling. I'm simply saying that that ruling could only have arisen in a culture where the kind of transformations uh, that I've been describing in this course had already taken place and were deeply embedded in the intuitions of how we all think. Uh, more recently, the Bostock ruling, 2020, has taken the logic of Anthony Kennedy, the logic of expressive individualism, to its logical conclusion. It's predicated on the separation of sex from biological Gender, the physical makeup of the body, does not define who you are. It's what you feel inside that really counts. That's where reality is truly to be found. What we see around us is the absolute triumph, if you like, of internal psychological conviction over any form of external authority. That brings me to the second area. That's law. Brings me to the second area, ethics. And here I want to look at the work of Peter Singer, 
Peter Singer, an Australian uh, in origin, but uh, has been most famously the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University. Singer's an interesting man because he's really very consistent. He's a philosopher who does not hesitate to draw the conclusions of his philosophy, even when they take him into what some of us would describe as reprehensible areas and horrible conclusions. He's perhaps most famous or infamous as an advocate not just of abortion, but even of infanticide. Now, infanticide shocks most people, even many pro-abortion people. But Singer justifies it on the basis that a newborn is not a person, cannot conceive of the future, has limited self-consciousness, and therefore should not enjoy the rights of a person. Now, that's an entirely separate lecture. I can't get into how he argues for that position and ultimately gets there. What's of interest in this lecture is this. The criteria he uses for deciding when the infanticide of a child might be justified. There are a number of stages in his argument, but the first thing to note is he rejects human exceptionalism. What do I mean by that? He rejects the idea that uh, human beings are exceptional. We're superior to all other beings and therefore a different set of rules should apply to us than apply to other animals. Uh, when you think about it, belief that human beings are different from animals is typically rooted in the transcendent. If you're a Christian, you believe that you're different to animals because you're made in the image of God. Think about the statement, made in the image of God. You're appealing to a transcendent frame. You can't make that argument in a world where the only legitimate arguments that are allowed come from the imminent frame. Think of Darwin in the 19th century developing the theory of evolution. Uh, you know, that really does relativize human beings by making us essentially a, a sophisticated ape. The whole idea of human beings being exceptional is something that has come under severe attack, severe pressure in the last 200 years. And think about it. If we're not exceptional, then why would it be more immoral to kill an infant or to euthanize someone with Alzheimer's disease than to kill an animal at a similar stage of self-consciousness? I was driving to uh, this lecture this morning and a deer ran in front of my car. Not an uncommon occurrence in western Pennsylvania. If I'd knocked the deer over it, it would have annoyed me that my car was damaged. If I'd knocked a child over, I'd have been devastated. Devastated. Would have changed my life forever. Singer would want to ask why. Why does the, they say the infant in the pram mean more to you than the, the baby deer? Similar level of self-consciousness. So the first thing that uh, Singer does, he gets rid of human exceptionalism. He puts it this way. My suggestion is that we accord the life of a fetus no greater value than the life of a non-human animal at a similar level of rationality, self-consciousness, awareness, capacity to feel, etc. No human exceptionalism. Second stage of his argument is he makes personal happiness the key to whether an unborn or a newborn should be allowed to live. And here he takes, as his example, the case of a disabled baby. And here I quote, The difference between killing disabled and normal infants lies not in any supposed right to life that the latter has and the former lacks, but in other considerations about killing. Most obviously, there is the difference that often exists in the attitudes of the parents. The birth of a child is usually a happy event for the parents. They have nowadays often planned for the child. The mother has carried it for nine months. From birth, a natural affection begins to bind the parents to it. So one important reason why it is normally a terrible thing to kill an infant is the effect the killing will have on its parents. It's different when the infant is born with a serious disability. Birth abnormalities vary, of course. Some are trivial and have little effect on the child or its parents but others turn the normally joyful event of birth into a threat to the happiness of the parents and any other children they may have. Notice, notice what justifies infanticide there is really nothing to do with the baby at all. It's all about the impact the baby will have upon the overall aggregate happiness 
of the parents. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that tie in with what I've talked about as psychological happiness rising as an ethical criterion over the last few centuries? Singer isn't writing this in a vacuum. He's building on the back of cultural pathologies that are already well established. And he doesn't make much difference, in fact, when he talks about a healthy newborn. Listen to this. Most parents, fortunately, love their children and would be horrified by the idea of killing it. Notice he always refers to the child as an it. And that's a good thing, of course. We want to encourage parents to care for their children and help them to do so. Although a normal newborn baby has no sense of the future and therefore is not a person, that does not mean that it is all right to kill such a baby. It only means that the wrong done to the infant is not as great as the wrong that would be done to a person who was killed. But in our society, there are many couples who would be very happy to love and care for that child. Hence, even if the parents do not want their own child, it would be wrong to kill it. Notice, the killing is wrong there because that child, not because he possesses any intrinsic rights, him or herself, but because it could be a source of happiness for others. Notice the underlying imperative. It's all about the happiness of the parents or the potential adoptive parents. It's the effect that the baby has on others that make infanticide right or wrong as far as Singer is concerned. This is that inner sense of psychological well-being as happiness that we spoke of in Lecture 1. Here it's the ethical criterion. Feelings, assertion of me as an individual, morality bending to what suits me, a view of human happiness reduced to the purely imminent. Singer's ethics epitomize the modern world's self-centeredness. Finally, free speech. When I was at college in the 1980s, uh, free speech was highly valued on campus. My history supervisor at undergraduate level was a card-carrying Marxist. I had very entertaining dialogue with him. I learned a lot from him. Campuses were free places for speaking and exchanging ideas between people who did not agree, even on some very fundamental issues. But now, of course, we live in a world of campus protests, cancel culture, demands for the banning of books and speakers that are deemed offensive. And that's odd when you first think of it. The traditional Western liberal order has assumed that the free exchange of ideas, for which free speech is the necessary condition, has assumed that this was a good. Now that's not the case. Speech is deemed oppressive and hurtful. Speech codes are being enforced. Why? Well, in a world where psychological happiness is the key to the good life, then speech which hurts is seen as a vice and not as a virtue. Listen, for example, to what the Marxist slash Freudian theorist Herbert Marcuse says about tolerance and free speech in his little essay, Repressive Tolerance, which is an interesting title in itself. When tolerance, we might say they're free speech, but when tolerance mainly serves the protection and preservation of a repressive society, when it serves to neutralize opposition and to render men immune against other and better forms of life, then tolerance has been perverted. And when this perversion starts in the mind of the individual, in his consciousness, his needs, when heteronomous, when heteronomous interests occupy him before he can experience his servitude, then the efforts to counteract his dehumanization must begin at the place of, entr of entrance, there where false consciousness takes form, or rather is systematically formed. It must begin with stopping the words and the images which feed this consciousness. To be sure, this is censorship, even pre-censorship, but openly directed against the more or less hidden censorship that permeates the free media. That's the world in which we now live, where words and language are deemed oppressive. Free speech becomes part of the problem, not part of the solution. And in what kind of wor world are words deemed oppressive? In a world where expressive individualism, 
and a psychologized notion of happiness fuse together to make crimes against my inner being by words some of the most serious crimes there are. This series has been, of necessity, very brief. But hopefully it shows that some of what seem to be the craziest, maybe most surprising developments of modern society, the anarchic sexuality, the ethics of death, the opposition of free speech, to uh, name just the three that I've had time to touch on in this lecture, hopefully it's shown that these have been a long time coming and are not inconsistent breaks with what has gone before, but merely the latest iteration of trends within the culture, within philosophy, that go back hundreds of years. They connect to those four things we noted in Lecture 1, expressive individualism, psychologized happiness and selfhood, the collapse of the transcendent into the imminent, and the sexual revolution. Now these lectures have been expository, more than critical. I've tried to expand fairly the views of those that I've addressed. Yet as a Christian lecturer, I feel the temptation as I uh, teach this stuff to lament these developments. There's no point in lamenting. There's no point in lamenting these developments. Rather, it's more important to understand. We need to understand our times so that we can respond more effectively to them. And it's my hope that these brief lectures will play some small part in helping you to do that. Thank you.